It is only when the mind refuses to flow with life and gets stuck at the banks of pleasure and pain, he's referring to, that it becomes a problem. By flowing with life, I mean acceptance, letting come what comes and go what goes. Desire not, fear not, observe the actual as and when it happens, for you are not what happens, you are to whom it happens. So I feel... In this quote, Nisigadat is talking about cultivating a mind that flows, a harmonious, flowing, peaceful mind, which then helps us to observe reality. Otherwise, we're stuck in this ongoing, frantic dance between pleasure and pain or desire and fear, which seems to characterize human life, doesn't it? When we do these podcasts, we always have to talk on a few different levels, but also acknowledge that there aren't any levels. Um, But it seems like there are levels. And we've got the mind level, you've got the bodily level, you've got the level of awareness, the level of consciousness, the level of I amness. They all point to the same thing because they are all of the same thing. But we're just sort of using language to hone in at different points. Of course, we always talk about things like meditation and and um, inquiry amongst other spiritual practices and they are all conducive for creating greater flow and calmness and um, many stay with just those practices don't they and the benefits that they bring he also talks about observing the actual which is then, to me, a step beyond just calmness and, and flowing. Actually, the mind is a process that you ultimately are aware of, whatever you are. You're aware of that mind process. And in a way, it's nothing to do with you. It, it, is, it is being automatically of itself. Obviously, it is you as well, but you're not just it. And you are not making it happen. It is happening of itself. All of this is happening of itself. It's not something you are making happen. You didn't make yourself appear as a human being. You didn't make your neurons function the way they function, the firing, every individual tiny millions and trillions of neuron firing. It has nothing to do with you. You're not doing that. They're doing, there's an intelligence behind it, which is doing everything. It's causing your heart to be... Um, the lungs to fill with oxygen and exchange um, gases with the air. You know, it's, it's how, where, at what point do you draw a line and go, well, this is what I'm doing now. So there isn't a point. It, um, it's all happening of itself. So the mind will be doing that. And if you can see that you are actually beyond the mind, the mind, what the mind does is what it's going to do. Then, and you really see it clearly, then it's, it no longer affects you in the same way. But um, that's easily said, obviously. And I do, I'm, I, I'm not one of these people that say you shouldn't meditate or shouldn't do spiritual practices because I think that's also nonsense. Um, if it feels necessary to meditate, meditate. I, I meditate every day. I, I just really enjoy meditation. Um, and I, I find it find it very pleasurable and um, it does it does have a nice balancing effect on me as a human it, but I also know that if my mind does still uh, find itself sort of riled up and stormy that's that's ultimately not my doing it's not me you know so there's two levels to that isn't there there's the sort of spiritual practice working on yourself creating more sattva a calmer mind and a more positive, peaceful outlook in general as a, as a person. And then there's going beyond all of that altogether and seeing you're not the person. You have nothing to do, essentially. You have nothing to do with it. You, you're not doing anything. But at this level, it does feel like you're doing something. And as long as it feels like you're doing stuff and that you are suffering, then stuff will be done to improve that situation.
you could kind of assume that he's actually talking about meditation or maybe just life in general and how to live. You know, there's this flowing with life, which you could call acceptance, letting come what comes and go what goes, which sort of sounds like mindfulness, doesn't it? Sort of basic mindfulness, not being attached to the future or the past, but being here now and, and also being sort of detached in a state of observation. Meditation, certainly with mindfulness, it can stay there, can't it? I am observing. I'm observing my thoughts. I'm observing my feelings, my sensations, these mental images coming and going. I'm observing my mood. I'm observing the, the grasping and the aversion. I am the observer. But of course, from a non dual perspective, and <laughs> it's not really a perspective, you're not even the observer. Later on in that, just after that quote I read earlier, he goes on to say, ultimately, even the observer, you are not. You are the ultimate potentiality of which the all-embracing consciousness is the manifestation and expression. You're not even the observer. Even the observing can be observed. You know, the even consciousness of all the stuff that comes and goes can be become aware of by a background of awareness then what is the origin of awareness and we just keep receding back as we always say into greater um, shades of truth really through a netty netty approach so you're not the observer and an observation can help create a calm clear mind and can help cultivate acceptance because you are, you are observing the situations, the events, the things that are unfolding, then at some point, to really get to the heart of spirituality, we then need to question, what is this observer? Am I even the observer? You know? And he says, you are the ultimate potentiality and the all-embracing consciousness in other words, the supreme self, the absolute, um, you know, or just that indefinable. Uh, yeah. What some, some quantum physicists say, you know, that there's a, a potentiality at the base of reality where nothing is, is decided whether it's a particle or a wave yet. It's all just in potential. Everything is in potential until it's, until it's observed. And it's the the uh, combination of the observer and this potential source energy, whatever you want to call it, this just potential intelligence that creates the appearances we call form in the world and even creates ourselves. Yeah, how do we go beyond awareness is my main question. Um, Potentiality is a great, a great word, actually. I mean, no words cut it but potentiality is a great word because we're not even talking about a form we're talking about a an unbounded capacity you are pure potential in i am that he says keep the i am in focus and remember that you are not what you are but that you are and watch yourself ceaselessly really that's all he advises and and it's even he himself said it was quite crude just abide in the i am in the sense of being in existence and to remember that you are and to watch yourself and i don't mean to watch necessarily the contents of your consciousness although that's okay as well you can do that as well I mean, also connect with your consciousness and watch consciousness, observe consciousness, your state of being, your sense of being. Consciousness becomes aware of beingness. Beingness becomes aware of I amness. I amness becomes aware of existence. Existence becomes aware of aliveness. And these are all synonyms of the same localized sense of awareness. And when consciousness becomes conscious of itself, it is aperceived as non-duality. And Nisargadatta even called it non-dual worship. 
consciousness worships itself, abides in itself, and there is no longer a belief in division or separation. No longer are we fooled by duality. And just by meditating on consciousness and consciousness becoming aware of itself, we go beyond not only form, but consciousness. And that stateless state, you could say, is pure awareness. And at that point, can we really say there is a, an observer and the observed? Can we even talk about awareness at that point? The person then merges into the observer and the observer merges into awareness and awareness into this pure potentiality. And, but then he says, identity doesn't get lost only its false limitation and conceptual restrictions are lost. Life goes on. It's not seen as definitive of what you are. No, that's um, it's an interesting place to be, isn't it? I was... Um, well, yeah, I was thinking about this, so obviously that's not <laughs> the ultimate source of what I am. But um, I, I was sort of contemplating this yesterday, and I thought it doesn't. You can get to a position, and not in a nihilistic way, but you can get to a position where it doesn't matter, does it? Anything that you say or do is kind of just part of this play. And it doesn't really matter. You know, there's no need to feel shame and guilt and am I making enough of myself? Am I doing enough as a person? Because it's it's not the truth of who you are. And it's funny how quickly you snap out of that as well, how the mind jumps in and it comes and goes, no, 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 you, you really need to be as good a person as you can and work hard and do this and that. And, and it can it will come up with lots of very you know decent reasons um, as far as you're concerned to try your best in the world but when you really see see things for how they are you you see it doesn't matter it the thing the weird thing about that is though it doesn't suddenly make you uh, a lazy selfish person it just frees it almost frees you up doesn't it it frees you up to kind of go oh okay oh that's a bit of a relief i don't need to worry about it so much now i never believed all these when these gurus and stuff you say it's all perfect it doesn't matter don't worry about it kind of thing i was like yeah it's easy to say like maybe you know you're in some high state where you're on this constant bliss experience and maybe it does seem like it's all perfect from there, but I see, I, to I see what they're saying now. It doesn't. It may feel like it really matters at times, and it may feel extremely painful at times. But in ultimately, it doesn't matter. It's not to dishonor those events or those memories or things that happened in time, and the the effect of them. No, absolutely not. Yeah. But it's to say, find out who you truly are and then revisit those, those memories and those beliefs about yourself and the world. But first of all, find out who you are. Ask, who am I? And sit with your self, your sense of being, your I amness. And get in touch with that first, connect with that first, and then do some self-inquiry into, into all of those things that you believe about yourself and the world. And, and some of that may be stored in the body as sensory um, blockages or energy. And yeah, it's, it's all possible. It's all possible that it affects the human, that it could affect your your experience as a, as a body mind, but you're not limited to the body mind. And that's the point really. I'd say find the truth first of who you are. 
and then see if you still want to perfect this body mind experience and if you do then that's absolutely fine um but see if that's still see if there's still a problem after you found out who you are um see if uh, the same things cause the same suffering you know when you it's it's about disentangling the self deconstructing the self isn't it it's just complete deconstruction of every assumption every concept you have about yourself dismantling it all um and seeing what's left at the end of it keep dismantling because everything that you think you are isn't it because what you are is the one that is aware of everything and that isn't a thing (laughs) so as long as you can be aware of it and you can think about it or you can imagine it it isn't that's not it um which is uh and it gets really subtle at this point uh, i've noticed you know where I had this thing where I was going, right, I should be awareness. You know, I I want to identify with awareness or consciousness. I kind of made it into a thing. And the mind would create a very, very subtle image of what that was. Uh, It would be sort of this spacious, sort of ephemeral experience that I thought... I should be having as awareness but that's that's nonsense that's just a description of nothing uh, that's that's not it that's something the mind's come up with it's before that <laughs> it's it's what you actually are it's 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 in implicit in this immediate experience you're already having it's not something else other than this experience um, it's not a different quality to the experience. It's not a diff- you're not suddenly become, you don't suddenly expand and, be- and encompass the whole universe. You might do, but that's, that, you know, it's, it doesn't have to happen that way. You, it's what's happening right now before anything else is added to it, before the thoughts, the concepts, the filter of the mind, anything whatsoever, anything that can be perceived whatsoever is added to it. There probably will be a point where you feel quite content with, I mean, truly content. I don't mean a state or a mood of contentment as in sort of, um, sort of superficial happiness, but question to the point and, and inquire to the point, deconstruct the point where there's this natural contentment and tranquility and where it's causeless and not attached to a certain happening, a certain self-concept. Because at that point, anything can visit you. Any, any mood, any thought, feeling, action, anything can visit you. But that's the point. It visits you. It comes and goes. You no longer believe it will stay around forever and, and tarnish you or, or affect you in a, a lasting way. So there's this, and again, we always use this because it's such a great metaphor, but it's like the, the tranquil depths of the ocean, which are always still and pure. And on top of that ocean, there's these superficial waves of, um, to relate it to what I'm saying, to, of thoughts and, and um, experiences and emotions. But that tranquility is always going on really just question the waves is the is the other waves the fullness the entirety of the ocean and when you strip away the superficial waves i don't mean get rid of them because you can't but look beyond them look through them into your depths into the uh, underlying tranquility and contentment then at that point the waves can go on you know, things can visit you, things can come and go. As Rumi said, this human life is a guest house, but nothing stays around. And, and, you know, so that is then a state of what you could say acceptance, because you're seeing that 
all of these waves are already accepted. So in my book, Living the Life That You Are, I, I talk about this. It sounds quite abstract, but it's very powerful. This realization that appearance is acceptance. I mean, look around you now at just the, the physical, tangible, materialistic or material objects. All of this stuff is sitting within this capacity of your house, your whatever, wherever you are, the street, whatever you're, whatever, wherever you, you're finding yourself right now. All of these objects have a, a just a natural, intrinsic place, and 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 you could say acceptance within this. But you, you, there's no one here trying to accept any of this stuff. <laughs> it's already allowed. It's already permitted. It's, it already has a rightful place in this space. You can't do acceptance just as you can't be in the now. <laughs> it's this idea of being in the now, being present. No, that's BS. You can't be in the now. You are the now. You are acceptance. They are just manifestations in this human story of your true nature. Your true nature is qualityless, but it manifests in this, in this world in countless ways. The true acceptance is actually seeing through that distortion that the, the sort of ego is creating of acceptance and resistance, that there's only acceptance. There's no such thing. There's, no, there's actually no option. You can't allow yourself to allow, and you also can't reject allowance. So there's some capacity of potentiality there that is, that is really okay with, with that feeling or that thought, even if it, even if it feels sort of scary or um, not okay. Is there something there that is, is holding space for that, being a capacity for that, just as the room you're sitting in or whatever space you're in right now is holding all these objects? There's, there's, no, there's no argument. The sky accepts the clouds there's there's no trying there's no doing acceptance you know no it's the it's the ego isn't it really well i heard eckhart tolle say that i should be accepting this and stay present in the now it just does it's spontaneously dealing with the situation without causing more suffering than necessary but the ego would go, well, I, uh, maybe I should try some methods to try and accept the experience or it will compound the experience of whatever kind of suffering it is by dwelling on it and adding, adding stories to it. Whereas, you know, it's all, it's all a distortion of the ego, of just, of just this pure happening, this pure aliveness, this energy moving, this nothing wrong or right about it. it, it before it's judged, it is just is. It's perfectly alive and natural and what it is. It's not unnatural. <laughs> There's some sort of feeling of it being unnatural and it needs to be quashed and, you know, dealt with somehow. But it's just, it's just energy. It's just aliveness. It's inherent in whatever this is, this reality. It is just moving through you at this moment. Um, and therefore, it's accepted. And it's funny, isn't it? Because you spoke about the ego's rejecting or refusal. Um, but even that's allowed, you know, because it's happening. It's appearing. Therefore, it's accepted inherently. It's all, it's all inherently allowed and embraced. Even the rejection, even the sense of not allowing, it's all that it's all inherently allowed. I mean, allowed isn't even a very good word at that point because it's, it's, it's quite mysterious, whatever that capacity of holding is. Um, I sometimes call it existential holding. It's all held. It's all, it's all held. Every possible thought, mood, state, emotion, perception, it's all held already with love beyond love, or compassion beyond compassion. We just humanize it, don't we? We, we always humanize. We, I mean, look at what we've, we've, we've humanized the absolute and called it God. And then, you know, from that point, created all sorts of ridiculous um, systems of 
basically control and call it religion, spirituality, but we are so quick to humanize or personify the indefinable. And sometimes that can be a barrier to knowing that you are already it because it's like, oh, I feel like this. And God is like that, so I, I can't be God. And I, I'm not acceptable to God. And, and certainly I'm not God because I don't match it with that identity that I've put on God. It's a funny old game, isn't it, we're playing? Um, it turns out that we can't be anything other than the source of everything. If you follow it back far enough, not we as people, but we as our essential nature, impersonal energy is the energetic source of everything. Is um, yet we're playing this game with ourselves. <laughs> we're we're not good enough uh, for God. This God that we've created out of ourselves. <laughs> When we are the very gods that we're we're describing, uh, it's just it's a funny game uh, that humans are playing. And then going back to inquiry, it's um, you said you said earlier, you know, remove all the falsehood, and what you're left with, you can't know with the mind. You can't pin down, or but as we always say, it's a deep knowing, isn't it? It's a deep knowing beyond the intellect, like prior to or beneath the intellect, the ground of knowing, which um, you never really move away from once you find it. You never really lose it, although it can be obscured for, for some time, but you always come back to it. The mind can't hold it because it's prior to if we can say prior and before and after, prior to the mind, it's the sort of very source of the mind. It's what gives rise to the mind. And therefore the mind can't catch hold of it. It's like, you know, a, a fish trying to catch hold of the ocean in a way, isn't it? You know, it's, uh, it's too immediate. Um, it, the very allowance of experience, the very allowance of there being some feeling of something happening right now, and it is, it's just the immediate, just the immediate aliveness that I am. It's, you just can't put it into words. And people have just tried, haven't they? Like, you know, and the Sargadatta just, what does he call it? The absolute awareness and then follow awareness back in the absolute. And awareness is, you know, is, is a good portion of the way there. You know, not something to identify. The important thing is not to then identify with awareness, I think. Humans, as you were saying about the religion thing earlier, about creating God, uh, I've seen this in myself throughout my life. I want, some, I want some belief. I want something to hold on to. I want to know what is this that's happening. Can I, is there anything to hold on to here that, I can, that will make me happy? And you can, you can brainwash yourself uh, and delude yourself into believing something but it's it that's not it it's it's beyond that it's not you in the end you're deconstructing the whole thing and this it literally what this does is leaves nothing to hold on to and it, that's why i think it's it can it's quite scary for humans to have that situation because humans don't like the unknown right you, you can see why belief systems are made up. It's safe. It feels secure. In the end, it's actually complete freedom. And there's, there's nothing scary about it if you can get past it. Yes. Yeah, so, and this I could ask speaks of this as well. It's in I Am That. It says, um, a day comes when you have amassed enough. Then sorting out and discarding are absolutely necessary. Everything must be scrutinized and un unnecessary, ruthlessly destroyed. Believe me, there cannot be too much destruction. For in reality, nothing is of value. Be passionately dispassionate. That is all. Counterintuitive, isn't it, in a way? You want to build. Humans want to build, move forwards, progress. Because there's this kind of a, this, this sort of low-level deep anxiety that's kind of pushing everyone forwards to me it feels that way anyway and 
there's a, a feeling of when I, once this and that is done, then I will be happy. And it's kind of, it's a game we're playing. There's a verse in the Tao Te Ching, which speaks to a lot of this. I'll um, read it out. Do you think you could ever take over the universe and improve it? I do not believe it can be done. Everything under heaven is a sacred vessel and cannot be controlled. Trying to control leads to ruin. Trying to grasp, we lose. Your life unfolds naturally. Know that it is too a vessel of perfection. Just as you breathe in and out, there is time for being ahead and a time for being behind. A time for being in motion and a time for being at rest. A time for being vigorous and a time for being exhausted. A time for being safe and a time for being in danger. The master sees things as they are without trying to control them. She lets them go their own way and resides at the center of the circle.